Episode 1, Colonial Beginnings. Hello all, this is the Eclectic Mr. D, and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to start on a subject that is sort of near and dear to my heart. The History of the United States Navy. Now to me, the most logical place to start would be at the beginning. So this episode is entitled, Colonial Beginnings. Yet, practically speaking, where exactly is the beginning of the United States Navy? There are actually several dates and events we could consider for this. The most common being 13 October 1775 and 27 March 1794. The first of these dates is when the Continental Congress passed its first act related to the raising of any sort of naval force. And this force would go on to become the core of the Continental Navy. The second is the date of the Naval Act of 1794, which reestablished a national navy nearly a decade after the last Continental Navy ship, USS Alliance, had been sold off in 1785. Yet, I think we have to go back further. After all, some of our primary sources for the era do. One in particular is the novelist James Fenimore Cooper. While he is better known for his book The Last of the Mohicans, later turned into a popular movie starring Daniel Day-Lewis, Mr. Cooper was also in the United States Navy himself and had a keen interest in it. Originally published in 1839, his History of the Navy of the United States of America gives a rather unique perspective of the early years of the United States Navy. In this work, Mr. Cooper starts with the first English settlements in the New World and doesn't actually hit the American Revolution until Chapter 4. I think there is a lot of merit in this approach. Cooper was trying to set the stage for his readers to understand the context of the Navy's creation. And, in his time, I suspect this starting point was adequate to the purpose. Yet I think we may need to go back a bit further to, say, 1492? So, why 1492? Well, as every American kid learns in school, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And while Columbus has become a person that many Americans have come to love to hate, his voyages really are very important for at least one major reason. They were the beginning of permanent contact between peoples of Europe and the Americas. Prior to the voyages of Columbus, there had been periodic contact between Europeans and Americans. For instance, it is now a well-established fact that the Vikings had landed and attempted to settle in what is now Canada in about 1000 AD, and there are stories of even earlier contact. Yet, these early contacts were limited, and in each case, isolation between the two places returned. Yet in Columbus's day, several key innovations and inventions would allow him to repeat his travels four times and to allow others to follow in his footsteps and expand on his initial efforts effectively. These changes included better theories of navigation in the hands of mariners, the magnetic compass, and larger, more robust, decked ships. Once in the Americas, Columbus and those who came after him were better armed, armored, and even tactically superior to the native groups that they began to encounter. They were also not focused so much on settling, as much as they were on exploiting the wealth and resources they encountered. Settlement was a means to an end, not the end in and of itself. It was through settlement activities that they were able to continue to harvest the riches of the New World, not only the gold and silver, but new foods such as potatoes, corn, and tomatoes, and what has become historically known as the Columbian Exchange. From the very beginning, Columbus and those that followed intended to use the locals to harvest this wealth. In a journal entry on 12 October 1492, Columbus writes about the first natives he encountered, saying that they ought to make good and skilled servants, for they repeat very quickly whatever we say to them. A few days later, also writing, these people are very simple and warlike matters. I could conquer the whole of them with 50 men and govern them as I pleased. Yet there was a big problem with this plan. You see, going back to the graphic of the Columbian Exchange, you may notice that heading from Europe to America was a whole host of diseases. These diseases were devastating enough in Europe and to the European colonists who came to the New World. 
they were even more devastating when exposed to a population without even the slightest immunity to them. These diseases, more so than even the warfare, slavery, or cruel treatment by the Spaniards or those that followed, are believed to have been responsible for the vast majority of native deaths. With the rapid loss of the native population, the European colonial powers had to look elsewhere for an effective labor force. Thus beginning in 1501, individual African slaves were transported from Spain to the New World in increasing numbers. The first large-scale shipment of slaves began in 1510. In 1526, the Portuguese completed the first slave trading voyage from Africa itself, where they had bought the slaves from local West African slave traders. This new trade across the Atlantic was an extension of a trade in slaves that had gone back centuries, yet the new route was dominated by the Portuguese. One thing to note about the Portuguese and the Spanish, both were Catholic, as was just about everyone when the Age of Discovery opened. Yet in 1517, a guy by the name of Martin Luther published a document called the 95 Theses in Germany, and thus began the Protestant Reformation. Over the period of a few decades, a number of countries left the Catholic faith. Key among them for our narrative is that of England, whose parliament in 1534 declared King Henry VIII the head of the Church of England. These new Protestants didn't recognize the authority of the Pope, under whose authority the world had been divided between the Portuguese and the Spanish, and who had in turn become so powerful through the exploitation of the New World. The English were one of several Protestant nations that wanted in on the action, and they did so in two ways. The first was to establish trading contacts, mainly by purchasing slaves in West Africa and transporting them to Spanish colonies in the New World, just as the Portuguese had been doing. In addition to trade, commerce raiding was also extensively employed against the shipping of other nations. Often the two activities would be done in the same voyage as a means of maximizing profit for the crew and investors. To support these activities in the New World, France and later England both tried to establish colonies of their own outside the areas that the Spanish had colonized. The Spanish were not keen on such intrusions. While the Spanish settlements themselves, in need of a labor force to be profitable, cared little who provided that labor force and openly traded with the foreigners, the crown had other ideas. One key such occurrence was when Spanish forces attacked and nearly destroyed a group of English privateers trading slaves in 1568 in what is now Veracruz, Mexico. This event led to the rise of one of the most powerful adversaries the French faced in this period, El Drago, the Dragon, or better known in England as Sir Francis Drake. Sir Francis Drake was one of several Englishmen who would serve to augment the then weak Royal Navy by harassing the Spanish under the tacit support of the English monarch, Queen Elizabeth I. In fact, Queen Elizabeth not only gave them letter of marquee that authorized the raiding of ships of enemy nations, she also invested significantly in their voyages and activities. Queen Elizabeth even granted a charter to Sir Walter Raleigh to attempt the first English colony in the New World. One of the express purposes of this new colony was to provide a local base from which English privateers could launch raids against Spanish treasure ships and secure that wealth for England. Raleigh first sent an expedition in 1585 that failed to establish a colony. In 1587, he sent a group of 115 settlers under one John White in a second attempt. Both of these attempts were hampered by poor growing conditions, the worst in 800 years, as well as the attempts of the Spanish to deal with the increasingly bold attacks by Sir Francis Drake and others against the Spanish. You see, not only were the English raiding the Spanish ships at sea, Queen Elizabeth of England was actively supporting Protestant rebels in the Spanish territory of the Netherlands, and Sir Francis Drake himself had been ravaging and sacking cities and transports along the Spanish main in New Spain. The Spanish crown had had enough, and in 1587 began to raise a force to deal with the troublesome island of pirates. This plan for an invasion was set back a year when Sir Francis Drake raided the town of Cadiz, Spain in April 1587 and destroyed 37 naval and merchant ships that had been preparing for the attack and captured a lot of their supplies. This fleet would not sail until August 1588 and the English knew it was coming. For Sir Walter Raleigh's colony at Roanoke, this was a bad thing. Roanoke's governor, John White, had returned to England in order to get much-needed supplies and relief. While he was able to set sail in early 1588 with such supplies, the ships he was in were raided by foreign privateers and had to turn back. Because of the sailing of the Armada, Queen Elizabeth had ordered all English shipping to stay in England to repel the attack, and so it wasn't until 1590 that John White was able to sail again. 
By this time, the settlement had ceased to exist, and it would be another 17 years before another settlement was attempted. Now, there has been a lot of speculation as to what happened to this colony, and it is known to history as the Lost Colony. Yet at the time, John White himself didn't appear too extremely worried about it. The name Croatoan was found carved into a post of the settlement, and was the name of a friendly Native American tribe who lived nearby, and the settlers had agreed to carve a Maltese cross into the post if the settlement was destroyed by force, yet none was present. Further, the houses that had been at the settlement had been systematically dismantled, more evidence that the abandonment had been an orderly affair, and that the settlers had simply moved to be closer to and supported by Native American allies. Yet a storm prevented John White from pursuing this lead at that time. It would be another 12 years before any further attempt was made to find out what had happened. This effort failed to even make it to the site of the colony, as did another in 1603. It wasn't until the establishment of the colony at Jamestown in 1607 that English efforts were in any way successful. Like Roanoke, this colony was established for commercial reasons and by Englishmen rather than England. As Cooper states, it was Englishmen and not England that founded the country which is now known as the United States of America. And that, in turn, turns out to be a pretty important distinction. From the beginning, the colonies of the Americas, established under English authority, had to have a degree of autonomy and rely on themselves to survive. Throughout the entire colonial period, it was the colonists who bore the brunt of the work in matters of defense, with the English and later the British crown only really taking an increasingly firm lead in the conflicts from 1688 to 1763 that preceded the revolution itself. Originally, much like the Spanish prior to them, the English settlers had sought to export gold, yet they didn't find any. Instead, Jamestown simply struggled to survive, losing large numbers of settlers to disease and starvation, before finally becoming self-sufficient enough to begin producing goods for export, with tobacco becoming the major cash crop. Not long after Jamestown started to become prosperous, Englishmen of a different sort founded the colonies that would later become Massachusetts. We in the United States know these people as the Pilgrims, and later the Puritans. Unlike the colony at Jamestown, these people came to the New World to escape persecution for having a different religion. Yet like Jamestown, they were financed by investors and expected to produce goods for export to pay the cost of transport and their initial support. Now, I know I've diverted a bit from the original intent, and a lot of this doesn't seem like it has a whole lot to do with naval history. Yet, I would point out these new colonies were successful only because they had adequate naval support from the mother country, something that Roanoke had lacked and paid the price for. Supply missions that brought not only goods, but new colonists were crucial to their survival, and without them, they too would have failed. Thus we can see that from the very beginning, adequate naval support was essential, not only for success, but for mere survival. And this would remain the case well past the end of the revolution. So that's it for this episode of the History of the United States Navy. And while this episode is a bit long, we've covered a lot of ground. We've gone from the beginning of European contact with the New World in 1492 to the beginning of the establishment of Massachusetts in 1620, a period of about 130 years. Next time, we'll focus a bit more on the new English colonies as well as the ones that would come into being as we get closer to the revolution. We'll examine a little bit about the origins of these colonies and why they were founded and by whom, as well as talk about some of the wars that went on in the New World and their effect on developments. We won't get to the revolution just yet, but we will cover some very important trends that will shape the initial character of the force. Stay tuned and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing.